Welcome to Easy Elim Learning Simplified. My name is Ruth and today we are going to be learning on sulfur and its compounds and our subtopic for today will be allotropes of sulfur. So we are going to get a chance to see these allotropes of sulfur, what are they and some of their properties and then we will work on one question. So allotropes of sulfur is you know that when you are defining what halotropes are in form 2, we said this um, is the existence of elements in more than one state in the same physical form. So sulfur usually exists in various forms uh, in the same physical state. So we have those two crystalline forms, that is the rhombic and, a mo and monoclinic sulfur. So rhombic sulfur is also referred to as alpha sulfur and monoclinic is referred to as beta sulfur. So what distinguishes them between rhombic and monoclinic is the temperature, we call it transition temperature. So they exist uh, in, in, in comparison to this transition temperature, their existence depends on this temperature. So some exist above it, temperature that one exists below it. So rhombic is a crystalline allotropic form of sulfur. It's also called alpha sulfur. It's usually the most stable in the, uh, the structures. So it exists as octahedral crystals and it has a density of around 2.06 grams per milliliter. Its melting point is 112 degrees, uh, 0.8 degrees Celsius. And when it's uh, slowly heated to 96 degrees Celsius, it changes to monoclinic or bitter sulfur. However, when cooled below, it turns back to rhombic form. So you can see this is our transitional temperature, which is 96 degrees Celsius. So above 96 degrees Celsius is the monoclinic. Uh, allotrope and then below is the rhombic allotrope. Uh, it's usually insoluble in water but soluble in carbon disulfide. So this is how it looks like. It's octahedral uh, in crystal form. So let's look at how it is prepared in the lab. So rhombic is prepared by dissolving powdered uh, sulfur in carbon disulfide at room temperature. After that, the mixture is filtered and then the filtrate is kept in a small beaker and covered with a filter paper. The carbon disulfide slowly evaporates away, leaving behind large octahedral crystals of rhombic sulfur. Remember previously we said that uh, sulfur, the rhombic sulfur dissolves in carbon disulfide. So that's the reason why it's possible to add the carbon disulfide and it will dissolve. So this is the setup. So we add carbon disulfide into sulfur and then uh, we allow it to cool slowly so that uh, the crystals can form slowly. It's that evaporation of the carbon disulfide. And so these are the crystals that form. Next is monoclinic sulfur. It's a crystalline allotrope of sulfur uh, when rhombic sulfur is heated to 94.5 degrees Celsius. It's usually stable above 96 degrees Celsius, which is the transitional temperature. And then when it's left at room temperature, it goes back to rhombic form. So you see, because room temperature is the most common temperature, you notice that rhombic is the one that is going to be to exist more um, than the monoclinic. Uh, it has uh, eight rings, S8 rings molecules in the crystalline structure. And it exists as long needle-like prisms and called, that's the reason why it's called primastic sulfur. So this is how it looks like or like that. Uh, it has a density of 1.898 grams per milliliter. It melts at 190 degrees Celsius and it's usually stable between 96 and 119 degrees Celsius. So below 96, it changes back to rhombic sulfur. It's insoluble in water, but it's also soluble in carbon disulfide as well. So it is produced by heating sulfur slowly in an evaporating dish. As you can see, this is our evaporating dish. 
So uh, until that sulfur melts, and then that sulfur is allowed to cool slowly. So during the cooling process, a, a solid crust will be formed on top, as you can see from the image. There is this uh, solid crust that is going to be formed on top. Uh, as it's going to be formed, you 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 form two holes on these crusts. You make them on this crust, and then you pour out the molten sulfur. So when you pour out the molten sulfur, on the lower side of the sulfur, you're going to see some needle-like primastic uh, crystals or needle-like shaped crystals. And these are the ones we refer to as monoclinic sulfur. So this is how they will look like. So also sulfur exists in non-crystalline forms or amorphous forms. So we have the plastic sulfur, which is prepared by eating powdered sulfur to boil, then pouring a thin continuous stream in a beaker with cold water. A long, thin, elastic yellow thread of plastic sulfur is formed. If left for a long time, it turns to bright yellow crystalline rhombic sulfur. And then we have another form which is called colloidal sulfur. It's formed uh, when sodium disulfate is added to hydrochloric acid to form a yellow precipitate. And then we have the milk of sulfur. Uh, it's commonly prepared, uh, it's, it's commonly called precipitated sulfur because it contains sulfate, it's a sulfate of calcium. It's made up of the precipitate obtained by the use of sulfuric acid instead of hydrochloric acid. When it precipitates uh, to form a pure sulfur, it's called now milk of sulfur. So you can see the difference between colloidal and milk of sulfur is just the acid that also that is used. Uh, so let's look at a few properties of sulfur. So one of, one of the things that exists in three uh, amorphous forms as we saw and two crystalline forms. We have the uh, plastic, colloidal and milk, the three amorphous forms and then the crystalline forms. We said we have the rhombic and monoclinic. And then a molecule of sulfur consists of a ring of eight sulfur atoms covalently bonded together as you can see. And then it's usually insoluble in water it's not polar, so it's soluble in uh, organic solvents that, like carbon disulfide, xylene, and toluene. It's a poor conductor of electricity. Since it's a covalent element, it's molecular in nature. So it lacks ions, it's either a charged ions or free electrons. So it doesn't have those particles that helps in conducting electricity. And then uh, what happens when we eat sulfur? When sulfur is heated um, out of contact in the air, it melts at low temperatures of about 130. We say the melting point is around 14 degrees Celsius. And then when it's melts, it forms an orange colored mobile liquid because the S8 rings usually open up to form S things of S8. So you can see that these are the SH rings. When it's heated, it opens up the chains to form the chains. And then on further eating, it starts to darken. So when you reach at 160 degrees Celsius, the, the liquid becomes darker and very viscous, such that the test tube can be inverted without the sulfur pouring out. The viscosity continues to increase until temperature of about 195 degrees Celsius. Reason why that happens is because the S8 rings, the ones that we had just discussed, are broken and then they jo join to form very long chains, as you can see, of sulfur atoms with over like 100,000 atoms. These are very long. This is what causes that viscous, darker uh, liquid. As the chain entangled with one another, the viscosity increases and then the color also in darkens. So near the boiling point, the liquid becomes less dark or red brown or mobile because the long chains are broken to shorter chains, as you can see. Now these long chains are broken to shorter chains. And at 440, uh, 444 degrees Celsius, sulfur vaporizes. The reason why it vaporizes, as you can see, it forms short chains mm -hmm. and it forms now small molecules. These smaller molecules are the ones that are given off as vapor. 
So the sulfur liquid changes states from to form sulfur vapor. So the vapor is light brown in color and consists of a mixture of molecules S2 to S10. If you heat further, the light sulfur vapor molecules dissociates and at 70, 750 degrees Celsius, the vapor constitutes of S2 molecules. So if you expose uh, to cold surfaces, the light brown vapor condenses to a yellow sublimate and the yellow sublimate is the one that is called flowers of sulfur. So on heating sulfur till, so going back a little, if you eat sulfur to almost a boiling point and then suddenly like pour it in a cold water, it's going to form a very thick mass shape. The sudden cooling it doesn't usually give it time to add the atoms to adjust themselves to either monoclonic or rhombic. So they intertwine themselves and they form a plastic sulfur as we had defined. This is how it looks like on the side. So let's look at this one question and then uh, close the session. The diagrams below represent two allotropes of sulfur. Study them and answer the questions that follow. So name the two allotropes. So we know this is going to be rhombic. And this is going to be monoclinic. So there are some situations where you are told to draw also the allotropes. Uh, or explain some of the properties of those allotropes. So you should be ready. And sometimes you can also be asked to explain the heating of sulfur and those steps that we have just discussed. So uh, this brings us to the end. In the next lesson, we are going to look at now some chemical properties of sulfur. See you then.